So the focus was on labor. And so I kind of want to do a, a run through of uh, the economy in general here to kind of set the stage for this capital market. <coughs> It'll also serve as somewhat of a review here for uh, next week's material. So uh, well, we started this class off with Tom on the island thinking about coconuts and fish. This clicker's not working. All these things seem to be. That happened in a different one, too. All right. <coughs> So there was gains from trade. We did the production possibilities frontiers, showed that Japan and the United States can be made better off with trade. Same is true with Tom and Jen on our island. So at a very micro level, or at a macro level, the economics is the same. If you bring resources to the table that are different than somebody else's, then each of you can specialize in what you're good at and share some gains from trade. You can do better together. It's kind of the ultimate, to me, in cooperation because you don't even have to like the other person it's a it's a very impersonal form of cooperation that goes on in the market system and that's what I think is pretty awesome about the the capitalist system is that when you guys go to eat your t-bone steak and you cut into it the farmer who raised that cow didn't give a rip about you right but yet you have this convenience to be able to run down to the country mart and pull a steak off the shelves for seven dollars and twenty five cents and fairly easily eat it, right? That's pretty cool. There, there was a lot that went into you being able to do that. That's the market system that brought you that product and made it easy to do. That is a lot of coordination and cooperation that's going on that wasn't the, the, the cooperation and the coordination weren't necessarily the intent of the parties involved, but they were just looking out for their own self-interest. And yet it all comes together in, in amazing ways. All right, so here's our basic problem again. How to satisfy unlimited wants with limited resources. And so I challenged you to think about the resources as being at a point in time, if we could just like freeze time, we could put all the land, which would include air, kind of hard to put in a bucket, right? Sunshine, all the kinds of natural resources. We've got labor, people willing and able to work. We've got machines and other man-made things that help make other things fall into this capital bucket and entrepreneurship. All right, so for any, what, what makes it kind of complex is that for any uh, given production process, there's multiple things going on, right? There's multiple resources embodied in that physical production process. We've got land, labor, capital and the farmer might just be the entrepreneur too all kind of bundled up into this picture is how the the basic resources manifest themselves so we talked about how the bucket level changes and so this chapter especially focuses in on these two aspects here so this chapter is on uh, loanable funds and how they relate to the stock of capital because machines and equipment and stuff is often using borrowed funds. Um, this market is especially uh, useful to, to look at. And so over the course of some time period, we buy new machines. Some of them wear out. And so at a future date, the bucket level is dependent upon the inflows and the outflows, the net effect. And um, what economists call that is net investment. So we've got investment, gross investment, buying new machines, depreciation, what's left over is net investment, and that determines the uh, level of capital in the bucket. <clears throat> we don't want to forget the physical production process that goes on in how output's made. So last chapter in labor, we learned about the, one of the top principles of economics, the law of diminishing marginal returns or product, right? And so the idea was that as I buy more and more machines for a given level of labor, notice how I switched that on you, by the way, as I buy more and more computers for a fixed amount of people, the incremental value, the productivity of each additional machine eventually falls. As I add more and more people to a fixed amount of machines, 
the amount of productivity of each additional person eventually falls. So the law of diminishing marginal product applies to all of these resources, which leads to some uh, challenges on how and what the best way to accomplish a task is. <clears throat> so our market system has households and businesses that are really one and the same because this is who we care about in society is all the people, the full population. But as a way to take advantage of specialization and to make ourselves better off, we can, a fraction of these people, about half, we call the labor force, organizes them the, themselves over here for eight to 10 hours a day and makes the stuff that we uh, all enjoy. And that sets the stage for the two primary markets in the market system. The output market, the market for final goods and services, and the resource market. Depending on what market you're in, you wear a different hat. If we're in the resource market, the businesses are the demand curve. They're the ones who want to buy resources because all of the resources are owned by a human being. The people that we care about ultimately over here, they own all the scarce resources. The formation of businesses is just a way to carry out the ultimate goal of getting final goods and services through the engine of exchange. And so the businesses are the uh, supply curve of the final goods and services. And the, the households are the demand for those final products, but the households are the supply of the resources. So it sets the stage for these two markets that uh, drive uh, the income and production for the nation. A very important part of having a, a well-functioning capitalist uh, uh, society is having a good set of rules, right? And having property rights, since in order for me to sell my stuff to Sawyer, I have to have my stuff that I own well-defined, and that takes a legal system and some courts and, and other, other uh, parts of our society, and that gets established by uh, the government. The government needs some funds to be able to carry out police functions and, and court systems and all of that. Taxes come from two places. One from the output market via a consumption tax. The other spot is via the resource market in an income tax. That's the only two places they can gather funds from. And so we've got a redirection of flows to provide some of these uh, public goods. The government, when they purchase things, goes to the output market. So in some respects, they're a player in that market up here, right? And they can turn out to be a pretty big player. In fact, when we looked at our cigarettes, GDP equals C plus I plus G plus X, how big of a player was G in the $15 trillion worth of stuff that's traded? Roughly what percent? Who's got that for an extra credit point? Yes? 70%. No, too high. That's consumption. I'll give you a point for the stab, though. Since you broke the ice, Gabe, you get an extra point for a wrong answer. How about that? How about that? How about the right answer, roughly? 20. Who said that? All right, Lewis. So we got about... 20% here in the United States, and that of course fluctuates, that's why we say approximately, about 20% of that activity is the government purchasing weapons of mass destruction and, and toilet paper for the White House and, and lots of other things, right? And then the government also draws on our resource base too, and we're going to talk about that in this chapter with a, um, how their Play, or, uh, their involvement in the market um, uh, affects prices, for instance. And so they hire people to work at the government to sweep the floors, let's say, in the White House, right? Our janitorial staff at the White House. Those people aren't working here, they're working here, and so they get a paycheck. And that's our circular flow with the government activity. Um, <clears throat> this last one was our... Uh, uh, large fraction of the spending, about 60% now and climbing, 
this is something that I do a little extra research on um, that, I, that I care about, is the transfer payments. So we take from the young, we give to the old. It's called Social Security. But it's really not a savings account. It's just a tax and transfer. Take from someone, give to someone else. It's like a little revolving door, right? Take from the employed through a little tax that goes on your paycheck. Give it to the unemployed through unemployment insurance, right? Take from the rich, give to the poor. You know, the whole thing is all that tax and transfer. So for every $100 of federal income tax that you guys pay in a year, about 60 bucks of it goes towards that type of activity. Okay, so that's a, that's a major part of it. All right. Um, so what about the rest of the world? They've got their own little exact same diagram going on up in China. And so now we enter the international trade, which we started off with, and we bring in exports and imports, our ability to buy and sell from other nations. And our businesses are selling stuff to them, our households are buying stuff from them. And so that all transacts through um, the, the goods market. Something that I don't have here <coughs> is the labor market interactions. Right? So it's possible that we could go to work for a foreign company. And so the, I can only put so much spaghetti strings on here before it would be unreadable. Uh, but there's interactions internationally in the factor market as well. All right, so there's our cigarettes. C plus I plus G plus X ends up capturing the business activity, the exchanges, the market exchanges that are going on in our economy. The important lesson was through the expenditure approach that all of that spending generates income for our households. And so the spending that we do as a nation is equal to the income of the nation. And then we got into this chapter six and started thinking about income per person, the per capita income, how that varies across nations, all kinds of exciting stuff. All right, so here is the new wrinkle. This is the new spaghetti strings that we're adding in in this chapter. Notice I added another ring, right? So we had the output market, the resource market, just like what we build up for. Now we've got this financial marketplace. The ability to um, have uh, uh, borrowing and lending through a global marketplace. And so <coughs> um, households can go put their money in a United States bank, but they could also go put it in a foreign bank. Right, so we've got saving activity as a part of our paycheck that comes in. If we make $100,000 a year, what fraction of that goes towards C and what fraction goes towards S? What do you think? More towards C or more towards S for the Americans? I'd say C. 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 C is more than just for cookies, and it's good enough for me. Everything, right? We've got a cookie monster. So, Americans like to spend money. Maybe some of you feel the same way, but we tend to have our own little revolving door. The paycheck comes in, the paycheck goes out. Right? So you guys know that that's kind of our culture, um, kind of our mentality. Uh, that might not be so good for, for long run economic growth. So that's what we're going to take a peek at here is to see what is the impact of having that type of mentality in, in, our, in our system. So let's track a few things. So here's you making a decision on what to do with your money. And so if you take 100 bucks and you buy some consumption goods, I got a luscious, thick, cross pizza here to, to be thinking about, or do I save for a later date? Maybe it's retirement, maybe it's uh, shorter term savings, I don't know, but we put it in a bank, right? So that's the decision that's going on. Well, let's track how that, where that goes in our, in our market system. So if we take the pizza, notice that I've got it zinging right through the goods market, heading to consumption, Pizza Village, picks up the tab and I've got $90 worth of pizza on the bill. Pizza Village takes that and of course pays their employees, pays their suppliers and we're right in the circle, right? So that's the, the spending circle we've been talking about. But savings jumps in here 
and heads to the financial markets. <clears throat> what gets done with it is different. So once it heads into the financial markets, banks are in the business of doing what? What are banks in the, how do banks make money? Investing it? Not as much, not, not in the form of like investing in stocks and bonds typically. They do play a little bit. How do banks make money? Interest, loaning it out, right? So there's something to do here with interest. So tell me the, the basic concept. They loan out and then put more meat on the bones here. They loan out at a certain interest rate, at a higher interest rate compared to? Our interest rate that we. Our interest rate as depositors, right? So they take money in from us and they pay us 1% and then they loan it out to people who want to buy a house for 5% and then they catch the spread, right? That's their game they play. The inflow of money comes in from deposits. They pay their depositors, their savers a certain rate and then they loan it out at a higher rate. Of course, they're taking on some risk with that loan. As 2008 proved, there's lots of loans that could go bad if they weren't minding their P's and Q's on, on qualifying somebody for a loan. That loan goes bad. It's not you, the depositor, that has to pay off the bad loan. It's the bank. So they're taking on some, some risk for that return. So <clears throat> when money flows into this ring, it very well might turn into a tractor. Where do they buy the tractor from? Well, they go to John Deere, they go to their local implement dealer in town or whatever. So similar to Pizza Village getting it, the tractor company got it. The tractor company takes that money, pays off their employees, pays their suppliers, pays blah, 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 blah. So really, those funds just kind of end up getting into the system again. All right, so hopefully you're thinking to yourself, well, what's the difference then? Well, nothing. All right, if we think about using scarce resources to make pizza or tractors or shirts, if there was $100 spent on a tractor or $100 spent on pizza, does GDP have an impact? No. Right? If, we, if we believe in the whole game of it goes into some business that you're either the tractor business or you're the, or the pizza business, it doesn't really matter. So what's the catch? How is it different? So I'm, gonna, I'm here to tell you that it is fundamentally different. And what are you, what are you thinking? How is that different? Awesome? Okay, you're not always buying new products. Um, you mean, and when you say products, you're talking about the pizza like, and stuff, or? Or like buying a used vehicle. Or buying a used vehicle, okay. So yeah, we did have um, new production. That was from something from our expenditure approach. Uh, but in terms of the GDP calculation, there's, there's still no difference there, whether we bought a new tractor or old. If, if we buy the used tractor, then it's just trading places with somebody. So no new wealth was created, it was just merely transferred from one perception to another. What's different about, think about what went on here. We, in one case, bought a tractor. In another case, we bought some pizzas, probably quite a few pizzas. At least, well, not necessarily at least, but up to 10. Probably bought, what, seven to 10 pizzas for 100 bucks. Tractors used to increase production. All right, the tractors used to increase production. So what we need to be thinking is a little more dynamically of what does the world look like tomorrow rather than just today. Us Americans are so focused in on getting today. The tractor, how many of you have seen a kind of a rusty old tractor sitting out in a field or on somebody's, somebody's land, right? How old was that tractor that you're visioning, envisioning? Just throw out some fun numbers. I'm just trying to have 30, fun with you. 30, 30 years? Is it possible that a tractor lasts 30 years? Anybody got an older tractor than that out there? 80, 80 years. That, that's no kidding. There's 80-year-old tractors out there. So that decision to buy the tractor back then carried forward not only to one year, but 80 years. It remained in production and was a productive part of our economy in terms of the capital, capital bucket. So that decision leads to economic growth tomorrow. 
In today's terms, it didn't do much necessarily for us. But over the long haul, if we start to change the composition of consumption goods and capital goods, it can have a big impact on what happens tomorrow, even if we're not getting all the fun that we get from pizza today. We're kind of forsaking fun a little bit, right, to put that off into the future. But if we change what's going on, at the aggregate level so that we have, in general, a few more tractors rather than a few more pizzas, that can have long-lasting effects on economic growth. Okay, any questions or comments there? All right, so, um, let's see, I think we're done with this. Oh, no, we're not. Because <clears throat> um, I wanted to bring in the, the wealth talk here. So this is one of your sheets, by the way. You guys have this sheet. Um, if, you, if you brought it, you can pull it out, just kind of eyeball along. Um, when we talk about somebody being wealthy, it's different than if you're just a high income earner. So, and, and we kind of confuse the two concepts often in, in, uh, in the world, right? We call somebody rich because they make a couple hundred thousand a year. But if they make a couple hundred thousand a year and they spend a couple hundred thousand a year, on pizza, beer, and chicken wings, then how rich are they? They're rich in one sense that they can buy a lot of goods in today's time frame, but they haven't stored up their wealth, right? They haven't built up wealth. Whereas you take another person who makes a couple hundred grand a year, they have a lot of fun consuming a hundred grand a year, but then they save a hundred grand a year. In 10 years, they've got a million bucks. They've got a million bucks worth of wealth. And so that's our wealth lesson here is you take the value of all the things that you own, your car, your house, your stuff that you have. You might have an investment portfolio now with stocks like Apple and, and GM and, and uh, Ford and Chrysler and all kinds of uh, maybe hundreds and thousands of companies. Right? We take the value of what we own, we subtract off what we owe, so if you have a little bit of a loan against your house, if you've got some other debt, take all your liabilities, subtract the two, and that gives you your wealth. Now, wealth for the nation of the United States is, uh, is something that's hard to measure, first of all. And so I did a little bit of estimates here and was at 50 trillion. I think if you look today, you could get some people estimating 70 trillion. What's our income again as a nation? I said it earlier, the income of the nation, something we should know for, for next week. 17, 17,000 trillion, trillion, that's right, trillion. So we're in the trillions, so we're making 17, 15 trillion a year, depending on if you're measuring nominal GDP or real GDP, right? Um, and we have $50 trillion worth of wealth. If we add up all of the assets of the United States, both private and public, so what is on US soil, we've got the, the Rockies in Colorado, we've got some national parks. Again, that's where it gets kind of fuzzy on how do you value a mountain that's owned by us in general, right? So there's if, if you start uh, looking at that, private assets are probably close to this, to this 50 uh, trillion or private wealth. Um, and so that, that's one way to look at our, our nation. So Adam Smith wrote the wealth of nations. How do we get a change in the wealth of nations? And so I, I like to think of those leaks in our bucket and the flows to next year. So the pizza, spills out on the ground, right? You might have a few fond memories of a good day that you had at Pizza Village, and man, that Pete, that Dennis Pizza. Have you guys had the Dennis, by the way? You really, I know Pizza Village doesn't seem to be the popular place, but I'll just put this little plug in. It's one of the best pizzas I've ever had. It's called the Dennis, and it's got toppings. The, the crust is not thick. It's kind of a normal crust, and it's about an inch thick. It is awesome. So check out the Dennis if you want to if you haven't had it, you should at least, you should at least give it a try. It, it's a great pizza. So, but even as good as that Dennis is, the memories don't last real long, right? And so you can think that we chose 
to have a form of our wealth, because if we had it in the form of cash, that's one way to hold our wealth. We turned it into a pizza, we ate it, we pooped it out, right? We didn't carry it forward in life. But that tractor, on the other hand, goes back into the pool of assets again into the next year and helps us make more stuff. And so those decisions that we make each year end up having this persistence and hopefully helping the wealth of our nation climb. Okay, questions or comments on that? All right. Now I think I got one little spin. See how the tractor stays and the pizza disappears? All right. Um, <clears throat> so here's the equation. We'll get into more details later. How is the cap the investment in the United States funded? Well, it comes from three spots. Now remember, we're using investment as a measure of the amount of tractors going on. How much is our investment going up? How, much, how is our bucket level doing here? How much of that activity is going on in the United States? Well, the funding for those purchases comes from savers. And we've got our three primary players that we've shown on our plate of spaghetti. We've got private people, people like you guys, We've got businesses included in that too. Those are the private sector. So we have private savings, government savings, and foreigners' savings. The rest of the world can invest in us. And that's it. That's, that's our three. We can kind of categorize all types of savings into those three forms. So I put the little whoopsie up there because the government over the last 30 years <coughs> has almost uh, every year, ex with the exception of about one, had G bigger than T. Now, as you look at this equation, if there's a deficit with the government, that the government is essentially dissaving, then they're taking away potentially some amount that's going towards investment over here. Unless that amount is made up here. Right? So we, we're going to kind of come back to this equation as we work through this chapter and think about the spots where savings occurs. Ultimately, we're going to get into a supply and demand diagram to kind of explain these movements. All right, questions or comments on that? All right, so let's save this one for a different day. Okay, so um, <laughs> all right, so let's see, we're going to start off with this one. to capture a lot of what we just covered with the loanable funds market. It's kind of a weird name. I'm not sure which uh, economist uh, textbook writer came up with that, but it's kind of stuck. And there's a, there's a couple different ways to go about it. I, I, I do kind of tend to think this is the, the best way to try to explain this. So the loanable funds market brings together brings together <laughs> borrowers and lenders. <coughs> to finance, get a loan, to finance capital equipment and 
capital equipment, um, real estate, uh, household, um, goods, uh, government, government purchases, slash transfers, all kinds of stuff. So that's the primary purpose of this, is to bring together those folks doing those sorts of activities. So the one thing that's um, different, I think, than like the labor market, where we had the labor supply curve. Who was the supplier again? Households or businesses? Households were the supply curve, the businesses were the demand curve. Who is the supply curve and demand curve in this market? Households, businesses, so if we start to think about Who's the borrower and who's the lender? I'll give you a hint. There's the plural. They're all involved. That's what's kind of weird. All right? So we've got households, firms, and government. And who is the lender? Again, potentially all of them, households, firms, and government. So at the micro level, um, we might be any of these. Uh, we might go to any of these places as, as potential borrowers or lenders. So we need to consider the net effect. Need to consider need to consider the aggregate, which since this is macro class, we need to consider the aggregate effect. <coughs> and our, our main lender or saver, our main lender is the household, the household savers. So it turns out the savers outweigh the borrowers at the household. So that, that would be kind of our net effect. At the aggregate level, we have more people saving their money than we have getting loans for on credit cards and car loans and house loans. We've got more people on average in the households that are the savers. And our borrowers, the borrowers are businesses, firms, who again have some savings and they might have cash balances and a lot of firms might pay cash for purchases. But on net, in the aggregate, firms are net borrowers. So they're on, our, on the demand side. And then in the United States anyway, the government is on this side. They have been a borrower for a long time. And so I want you to make sure you put a special highlight. That's not necessarily true of every government, but since we're in the United States, this is true for the US. You go over to China, and that might be a different different story, right? They might collect more tax revenue than government spending in a given year. In the old days, the United States, as we, we'll get into fiscal policy, one of the last chapters we get to, um, used to be a borrower some years and a lender other years. So sometimes we collect more taxes than we spend, and sometimes we collect less taxes than we spend. So sometimes we have a deficit, sometimes we have a surplus, and we kind of teeter back and forth depending on what's going on with the economy. 
but now we've become a persistent borrower. All right. Um, so how does that shape up with some supply and demand curves? So draw a nice big graph for yourself. <coughs> We're going to have a downward sloping demand for loanable funds and an upward sloping supply of loanable funds. These borrowers and lenders kind of battle it out in the marketplace. And ultimately, there ends up being a market interest rate on borrowing. We're measuring loanable funds, how much funds are available for loans. So this is in dollars. And so there's a certain amount of trading that goes on in this market between borrowing and lending. The interest rate that we put here, we're going to put a little r. The equilibrium, equilibrium interest rate, um, you know, just for motivation here, let's just say it's 5%. That is called the real rate of interest. There's that real word again. What do you think that means if we're looking at something called the real interest rate? What makes it so real? There's a base year involved of some sort, yeah. So more generally, what's been done to the interest rate? What's been done to it if it's the real interest rate? Just in general, I'm not asking you to come up with a formula or something. There's probably a base year involved, I'd agree with you there. What? Then for, if you said it's the base year for the frozen, then. Okay. Uh, yes, so what have we factored into account? Inflation. Inflation, right? So we filtered out that price effect so that if we earn a 5% return on our money, then that means something in terms of purchasing power, right? So, for example, suppose you invest $100 into an account bearing <coughs> um, 6% interest. So the nominal interest rate, the interest rate equals 6%. If the price of a hamburger is $1 and there was 4% inflation. What is your real rate of return or your real interest rate? thinking about it. Am 
might want to pull out your calculator if you got it handy. So if this is your situation, what's your real interest rate? Maybe let's walk through a couple steps together. What's your first step in tackling this problem? What's your first step? Brandon? You find 4% of 100 and then add that to 4%? 4% of 100? I'd say no on that being the first step. But I appreciate your jumping in and breaking the ice for us for an extra credit point for your wrong answer. Thank you. Under? Find the what? Okay, so how would you do that? Yeah, that sounds good, like a good step here. What's the interest earned? What do you got at the end of the year, Gabe? 106 bucks, right? So we got 106 bucks. So today, our cash balance that we have, as far as our, our income, if you will, just kind of cash available, checking account balance or whatever. So our income today, in 2014 <clears throat> is equal to $100. And by saving it, my income, my spendable amount of money tomorrow is 106. How'd I get that? I took, if I go in slow motion here, I took 100 times one plus the interest rate. Our gut pretty much gives us that answer right away. But if I put my equation goggles on, it looks like this, right? I got $100, I took 6% times 100 is six, 100 plus six is 106. With me? So I got 106 bucks today. That reflects my 6% interest rate that the bank told me they'd give me on my money. First step of the problem. What should we do next? Figure out how much the burger costs. Cost. Good. So the burger cost me a buck. So how many hamburgers could I buy today with my hundred dollars? A hundred hamburgers, right? So that's where we're going with this one now. So step number two, what does so the price of the hamburger in 2014 today is a buck, but because of inflation at four percent, that hamburger price, that dollar menu is not going to look like a dollar anymore if they didn't shrink the size of the patty on me, which they do that sometimes too, right? They're going to cost me how much? Dollar and four cents. So the price of a hamburger is now a buck of four. Good. We're chugging right along. Step number three. How many burgers can we buy? Good. So step number three, burgers run me a buck oh four and I've got 106 bucks. So how many, what's the quantity of hamburgers I can buy in 2015? I've got 106 bucks. Each one runs me a dollar four, giving me 101.92. So that's how many burgers, remember. This isn't like the inflation rate or the price level or something. That is the quantity of hamburgers. That's how many hamburgers I can have. 2015, of course, what could I have in 2014, we just said? We had 100 bucks, they each cost a buck. I could have 100. So what is my real rate of interest? The last and final step. How do we calculate that? Let me go to somebody else here. Who's, give me somebody I haven't heard from. Don't make me go to the random number generator. Wait, is that again? Uh, what is my real rate of interest? So that was my ultimate question here. What is your real rate of return? All right, let's hear it. What do you want to do? 
Okay, so 101.92 divided by 100. No, but I appreciate you jumping in. Give me your name again. Brandon. You're Brandon. I thought, yeah, you were another Brandon. Last name? Edwards. So, once again, Brandon is dead wrong, but earned an extra credit point. Michael? Ah, yes. Ding, 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 ding. That's worth an extra credit point, right? That's our new number minus the old number divided by the old number. That was the rate of return stuff that we did for economic growth, what we did for the inflation rate, what we do for any rate of change. Take the variable x, take the new number minus the old number divided by the old number. That gives you, that's your rate of change formula. And so if we do that, what do we get? 1.92, and there's a little bit of math here with shuffling uh, uh, decimal points around. About 2%. So our real rate of return was 2% on our, our money, and that's how we factor in inflation. Now, a guy by the name of Irving Fisher was a super brilliant brainiac guy that ran around naked in Yale. There's some good stories about him, but he kind of lost his mind from the stock market crash in 1929. He lost tons of money for his family and friends because he, he was the smart guy that knew everything about investing. They all lost everything during the Great Depression. He was still pretty smart after that. He came up, I can't remember what date it was that he came up with this, but he came up with an easy formula. So don't pack up yet, just write this down, it's pretty quick. The real rate of return, if you guys look at these numbers, maybe you would have put it together like Irving did, the real rate of interest is pretty much close to being equal to the nominal rate of interest minus inflation. Check it out. 6% minus 4% equals 2%, 1.92. It's a pretty good approximation. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty good approximation. Yeah, you can do the little squiggly if you want. Yep, the you mathematical people. All right, we'll pick up there next time. Squiggly line.